Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, that sounds like a line for a commercial right there. <laughs> Not, no, but w- welcome back, Mark from Anaheim. Good to have you here. You know, uh, some people should know that Mark is not your real name. You're not really from Anaheim. And, you know, we, we just had to use that nom de plume when you was on the radio back when you were sort of working uh, locally and federally as well. But Mark spent his first five years roaming the streets of Harlem before being sent to segregated Jim Crow John's Island, John's Island in South Carolina to live with an aging grandmother. He's listed in the international who's who of professionals, and he's a former member of many of the globalist organizations which few have ever heard about, but we've talked about them. He's also provided briefings to NATO personnel regarding less than lethal, also non-lethal technology. Also has provided counterterrorism training to personnel from many federal and local law enforcement agencies. He's both a retired U.S. Marine Corps Mustang infantry officer as well as a retired LAPD patrol supervisor. Mark is an FBI certified range master and has provided technical assistance for several popular Hollywood movies. Now, since retiring, he has returned to life as what he terms a lazy surfing beach bum, where he spends much of his time coaching and mentoring some of the most successful young female surfers from around the world. That's Mark from Mannheim. So, Mark from Mannheim, thank you for joining us today. I'm just the soul whose intentions are good. Oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. So you had the brother on there a few minutes ago talking about Cuba. And you just mentioned the yeah. fact that I coach and mentor surface from around the world. I was seriously considering um, approaching Cuba to try to be their head coach for their surf team. Because, you know, in 2020 is going to be the first year that the Olympics is going to have surfing. Now it's going to be supposed to be just an exhibition sport, but a lot of folks right now are jockeying for places on various uh, nation teams around the world. In fact, a lot of surfers who live in this country, because they have a mother or father who came from another country, they know they don't have a chance of getting on the U.S. team, so they're now saying, you know, I'm on the German team or I'm on the uh, Mexican team. And um, Right. Because they, they want to be the, to to win a medal or a gold medal or just any medal at the first, you know, and you say for their exactly. grandchildren, you know, I want to, yeah. And I was going to approach cool. Fidel because um, Fidel has always been down with the brothers, man. <laughs> you know, seriously, he's like the, it's like the brother said earlier before, before I came on. You know, there's a whole lot of misnomer about Cuba, but that's a, I mean, I could do a 12, 20 hour show on what people think they know about Cuba and what I actually know about Cuba. I'll give you a, a, a look. Since you're down there, because, you know, you, Mr. Nelson, you and I used to do shows when you um, had the station down there in Florida. And what was great about having that show is you had so many black folks who are not from the U.S. who came from the diaspora. And, of course, the show probably was heard in Cuba. So you had a lot of people who came in from Haiti. You had, uh, of course, the Maddie electors who were brought in from Cuba. But, you know, a lot of folks who from the Latin American countries and stuff. And so it was really great having listeners coming on who personally experienced some of the U.S. colonialism, imperialism doctrine from their countries and ended up having to come here as refugees. So, um, but I'm going to ask you a question here just to put you on the spot because I know you're a very sharp individual, but once again, there's so much about Cuba that we think we know, but we don't. When that whole revolutionary thing was going on in Cuba, Mr. Nelson, who do we support? <laughs> we support the other side, of course. Bautista? <laughs> That's what they told us. Absolutely not. We initially supported Fidel Castro. And when mm. Fidel Castro wasn't going along with the puppet masters, that's when the U.S. switched side and began supporting Fidel, I mean, B- Bautista. Bautista. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, that's not talked about much that uh, we were behind Fidel at the start. Hell yeah. Fidel's not a communist. Fidel's a Jesuit. <laughs> just like Bill Clinton's a Jesuit. <laughs> and just like this whole, and that's why right now, I, even though I'm not Catholic. Right. I, Hold that thought I, right there, because you hear the drummers warming up. we got to take a quick break here and check the traffic and weather in the DMV. I'll let you finish your thought on the other side. Folks, you want to speak to Mark from Anaheim, reach out to us. Our number is 800-450-7876. Your calls are next on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. 
And thank you for rolling with us, folks. Our guest is Mark from Anaheim. The number to call to speak to Mark is 800-450-7876. Mark, I'm going to let you finish up your thought that you started right before we interrupted you with the traffic and weather. And then if you could go on, move on to uh, Starbucks and, and give us your thoughts on what happened to Starbucks. <laughs> so, go ahead. so anyway, uh, what I was saying before the break was very few people in this country seem to know that we actually were the ones supporting Fidel Castro. And only after he refused to be a puppet the way the imperialists in this country wanted him to, that's when all of a sudden we decided to support Bautista. Now, um, of course, for some of the folks who want to get a, a, a an insight, but it's you know it doesn't go into detail far enough. Go back and watch the movie Godfather Two. It shows you the revolution down there and how the mafia got run out of Cuba. And that's why they brought the casinos to Las Vegas. But um, a movie I highly recommend, I'm a big Alfred Hitchcock fan, but a movie I highly recommend, even to this day is relevant, is a movie called Topaz. In that movie, you'll see, now of course they don't mention Castro by name, but it's pretty obvious who they're talking about. And you will see how when he came to New York to speak to the United Nations, where did he stay, Mr. Nelson? The, was it the Hotel Teresa? Was, is that where he stayed? And where is that located, Mr. Nelson? Harlem. There you go. You hear that, folks? Like I said, Fidel Castro was always down with the brothers. He stayed in Harlem. So you watch this movie, Topaz, because that movie also shows you a black guy working for CIA posing as a journalist. <laughs> mm. who interviews the character who they don't say is Castro, but <laughs> it's obviously Castro. Topaz, folks. Classic movie. And um, Castro was a Jesuit. Now, what I was saying before the break is I'm not even Catholic, but I pray for this pope because guess what? He's a Jesuit. Jesuits don't become popes. Hitler hated the Jesuits. Killed lots of Jesuits. And this pope has done something that no no pope has done in, since the 1700s, forcing the head of the sovereign military order of Malta, Knights of Malta, to resign. Because these folks want to all out war, caliphate against the Muslims. They want to eradicate all Muslims off the planet. And this Jesuit pope is standing in their way. There's a serious war going on within the intelligence community, Mr. Nelson, but there's also a serious war going on within the Catholic Church. And um, President Obama... Let me tell me here for a second, because he said uh, he caused, caused quite a stir recently, because he said there was no no, no heaven. <laughs> and then, you know, they tried to clean it up. No. Pope, but go ahead. He didn't say that, and he didn't. they didn't try to clean it up. But since you brought that up, that's what I'm going to. I just told you, the folks who want an all-out war, eradicate every Muslim off the planet, hate the Jesuits. And you just repeated their propaganda. They're trying to foment hatred and anger towards this pope. This is exactly what I'm talking about. One, the the quote allegedly came from a guy who's 90-plus years old, who wrote, who had nothing in recording or documented to even prove that what was allegedly said by that pope was said. And mind you, I'm not Catholic, so I'm not here to defend the Vatican or the pope. But the Vatican has a lot of blood on their hands, and this particular pope wasn't exactly the cleanest guy down in Latin America. But I'm just telling you what's going on right now. And what you just said is the propaganda I'm talking about to try to take this Jesuit pope down. Because he's standing in the way of Trump and these other guys who are in the White House right now who won an all-out war to ethnically cleanse all Muslims off the planet. I already told you, we're headed for a civil war, which has already started. <laughs> you can see that again in Antioch, Tennessee. And we're headed for World War Three. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I tell you this. So just that kind of propaganda that's being put out there already disseminated to let you feel less um, sympathetic towards this pope when he comes under direct attack. That's another reason why I pray for him. And down in Cuba... President Obama was wise. He opened up negotiations. Why? I don't think... Have you ever had anybody come on your show, Mr. Nelson, beside myself and mention BRICS? Brazil, Russia, India, China, yeah. and Syria? Yeah. 
Because yeah, see, I just put Syria because it's South Africa, right? South Africa, yeah. <laughs> but see, Syria was going to be part of that plan, and that's where you see what's going on there. Anyway, Cuba was thinking about joining BRICS. Well, BRICS is going to go after the American dollar as the world, based on the world's economy. So you can't have a country 90 miles off the shore of Miami now in bed with BRICS that would help take down the U.S. dollar, the U.S. petrodollar, as they call it. So President Obama wisely opened up negotiations with Cuba. What are the first thing these John Birch Society jerks did when they got in, into the White House? Started spreading propaganda about acoustic weapons being used down in Cuba against our intelligence assets, and they're all coming down sick to start fomenting the anger and hatred towards uh, Fidel's brother, Raul, who, of course, as you know, he's leaving office now. Um, and so now we've already removed much of our intelligence asset on the ground in Cuba. And more importantly, as somebody who personally has received commendations from the State Department for training both U.S. Marines and State Department personnel who later served in embassies, as well as somebody who had who was granted access by the State Department far more than most people are who've never been an actual employee of the State Department. I never thought I had seen as much damage done to the State Department as I did the first week of the Trump-Pence administration. Any idea why I say that, Mr. Nelson? No idea. Because in the first week in office, he fired every damn U.S. ambassador we had around the world. I'm sure most of your listeners don't even know that. In fact, right now, as I'm speaking to you, there are at least 30 countries in the world that we have no U.S. ambassador representing this country's interests or having anybody on the ground knowing what's going on or having diplomatic talks. I thought that was the worst thing. And I, by the way, I warned folks about this because when the whole Benghazi thing was going down, which was nothing more than a coup attempt against Barack Hussein Obama, gee, what a shock it happened on 9-11, 2012. Wake up, folks. And, of course, Petraeus, which is ironic, too, because, I mean, I actually had done a Facebook rant back in 2009 telling folks how they're purposely com um, comparing Barack Obama to Franklin Roosevelt and how Franklin Roosevelt needed Smedley Butler to stop the coup attempt against him. And I'm like, will there be, a, will there be somebody as a Smedley Butler for Barack Hussein Obama? And sure enough, David Petraeus fell on his sword to save Obama's administration. But anyway, um, I say this to you because when people say make America great and folks think, well, that's Trump talking about making America white again. You got to think internationally. You got to think globally. And these John Birches who were created after MacArthur was forced to resign, this country in their mind hasn't been great since Harry S. Truman fired Douglas MacArthur. And places like Cuba would have been wiped off the map if MacArthur had been in office at the time. In fact, you may not be aware of this, Mr. Nelson, but during the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis, well, let me just ask you this. I mean, there are a lot of listeners out there, especially young listeners. Why did we pull our missiles out of Turkey, Mr. Nelson? No idea. You know, people for many, many years kept talking about how Kennedy showed his strength and the U.S. didn't put up with Castro, blah, 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 blah. And then I came on your show back in the early 90s. I'm like, wait a minute. Um, that might be his story, but that's not the history. And you, and you asked me, what does that mean? I go, the only reason Castro, along with the Soviets at the time, call, uh, pulled the missiles out of Cuba is because of the same reason why they put those missiles in Cuba. The United States had missiles in Turkey which is not very far from Soviet Union, of course, today, Russia. And until we pulled our missiles out of Turkey, they didn't pull their missiles out of Cuba. Now, most of that information wasn't even released to the public until... In fact, I bet right now I'm speaking to your, to your listeners on your show right now, most of them don't even know that. Because they've been brainwashed for years and years and years that it was only because the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Navy went down there. But the reason I'm telling you is because even during that Cuban Missile Crisis, Mr. Nelson, there were certain individuals within the John Burr Society, high-ranking generals and stuff, by the way, who was involved with the Kennedy assassination, who were also involved with the sabotage of the Bay of Pigs invasion to make Kennedy look bad. In fact, the general who was leading that 
sabotage against Kennedy. His brother just happened to be the mayor of Dallas the day Kennedy was assassinated. But what I'm saying to you is, during the missile crisis, folks have no idea how close the United States came to sinking Soviet vessels. And because of the misinformation and disinformation that was being put out there, there was actually a Russian sub, well, Soviet Union sub back then. That when back in those days, they only had one missile, and and they and unlike the United States, where most of it has to come from the president, they give autonomy command to their individual ground commanders, Mr. Nelson. So what I'm telling you is, if, if there was a general in Cuba who felt the U.S. was a threat, they'd launch the missile. Same thing on the submarine. This commander on the submarine, he thought the U.S. was actually um, dropping depth charges to kill them, and they were gonna they were going to launch their only uh, nuclear torpedo that they had on the sub. Folks have no idea how close we came to an all-out war. And we're right back there again, Mr. Nelson, because it took a long time for them to get in the White House, but they're in the White House now, bigger and stronger than ever than with the day that Kennedy was assassinated. And they they won an all-out nuclear war. These these folks are psychotic. They truly believe you got to bring in some heathen like Trump because God is using him as we come up to the break, and I'll finish this so we can take some phone calls and go to your Starbucks. <laughs> okay, all right. right. As you mentioned, we've got to take a quick break, folks. 800-450-7876. Speak to Mark from Anaheim. Your calls are next on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. And thank you for rolling with us and our guest, Mark from Anaheim. Number to call to speak to Mark is 800-450-7876. We've got a bunch of folks all across the country want to speak to you, Mark, but I know you're going to finish your thought and take us over to uh, Starbucks. Yeah, so, you know, it's sad because um, just like much of the propaganda put out there against Cuba during the so-called Cold War, these folks from the MacArthur way of thinking which, of course, Mr. Nelson, I'm serious when I'm telling you this. They look at a nuclear weapon as just another tool in the arsenal of uh, military. Um, much of the progress that was accomplished at the end of the so-called war, they're dismantling it now. And um, Cuba is a prime target for major propaganda. If not, uh, <laughs> go back and try to redo the Bay of Pigs landing, but this time do it the way they want. And I have to tell you, the Bay of Pigs was never a plan of John F. Kennedy. Now, don't don't get me wrong. <laughs> Kennedy was no saint. And the uh, Special Warfare School down at Fort Bragg is actually named after John F. Kennedy. He was big in the Special Warfare. A lot of folks like to, you know, rewrite history and talk about how Eisenhower wasn't a warmonger. But what Eisenhower did, well, we have a saying. <laughs> we, um, <laughs> When the Marines are too noisy, you send in the men of CIA. And... Eisenhower sent CIA all over the world. We overthrew countries like, you know, Guatemala, Iran, tried over un- unsuccessfully in places like Hungary and areas right now that's having major rises in fascism. And so Castro was one of those that, as I said earlier, we initially supported Castro and then we supported Bautista. And when Bautista was forced to flee, Castro came into power, so he became enemy number one because he embarrassed you. It's kind of like Mr. Ness, it's kind of like Haiti. Europeans cannot stand Haiti because Haiti whooped Napoleon's butt. And basically, Castro put a thumb in the U.S. eye. And they, you know, as you know, they've done many, 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 many attempts on Castro's life. And since, you know, I'm into books and movies, and I always try to make it easier for the, the person out there who might be the laziest but can get information that will better understand. I strongly recommend they see the movie Ruby. That movie ties into the whole John F. Kennedy assassination, but it also ties into the mafia and what was going on down in Cuba. Much better than Godfather 2. So, you know, there's information out there. And I know we have a lot of younger listeners who are like, what the hell are we talking about? Folks, if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat it. And the folks in the White House right now, they plan on repeating it. And uh, Cuba's target number one, because Cuba is the closest to our shore. Um, I know the brother was talking about medical schools down in Cuba, but that's not the only one, Mr. Nelson. Grenada is another one. A lot of folks in this country who can't get into medical school go down to Grenada for medical school. And I know because I coach female surfers from Chile, Peru, Brazil, Colombia, 
I got girls from all over down in Central, and this and Mr. Nelson, there is stuff going on down there you're not hearing anything about. Did you hear about the most recent murder of a journalist while doing Facebook Live? No, but I, I'll, I'll say this: I did go to uh, Grenada after the uh, after was it Reagan who sent the troops down there and they shot up the school down there. And, and why did he do that, Mr. Nelson? Uh, claims there uh, because the, he was after some guys down there. They were going to, uh, I guess, turn the island into a communist. That, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you finish what you were going to say, and then I'll tell the listeners real quick why that was before we get into Starbucks, because this is really <laughs> this is history they need to know. But go ahead, Mr. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Maurice Bishop, I think his name was. Of course he it was. was. He, Maurice, yeah. He, he, yeah, he he was the leader, and uh, uh, they, they didn't like what he was saying. So if they, uh, he sent the troops down there to protect Americans who were attending the med school down there. Uh-huh. So after that, I went, I went down there after. It was a long, I can't recall it, but I, I do remember the, I going can. in front of the school and seeing <laughs> the bullet holes in, in, the, in the school, you know, and say, hey, see what your taxpayers' money paid for, these holes in, this, in the, the building <laughs> yeah, where the students were going to school. And, and you know where I got around. orders? You know where I got orders the day Reagan ordered the uh, attack down in Grenada? When? Why? I got orders to Cuba that day. Remember, we mm. got Guantanamo Bay down there. Right. <laughs> so trust me, I know, folks, what I'm talking about here. But anyway, um, so would you like me to enlighten you on what really happened? Sure, please. <laughs> yeah, that's why a whole lot of people are praying for me before they show today, because they know I don't give a damn anymore. Um, we had just lost over 200 U.S. Marines, U.S. Navy, U.S. Navy SEALs. And not one, but two different barracks bombings in Beirut, Lebanon. So while all these folks, by the way, that was John Birch Society, Ronald Reagan administration. Never mind the fact that there have been many warnings before that time. And um, to distract the U.S. population, because all Reagan did was pack our bags and have us come home. And this is personal for me, because I actually pulled some strings to have one of my Marines out of 29 Palms get a hardship transfer from 29 because that was part of the rapid deployment force. And he was the only surviving, not son, but grandson, because he was living with his grandmother in North Carolina before he went in the Marine Corps. And because he was the only male left in the family, I pulled some strings to get him out of my rapid deployment force unit up at 29 Palms, had him transferred to Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. You know, I know you folks call it Lejeune, but it's Lejeune. And um, what ends up happening? We're part of rapid deployment force. We never got deployed during the whole thing going on in Beirut in the aftermath. That Marine who I got the hardship case so he could transfer to be closer to home and not being part of rapid deployment force, he got blown up in Beirut. So trust me, folks, some of you folks talk about this stuff like it's like some distant knowledge. It's personal for some of us. And um, Reagan just had everybody pack up and leave. And then. Grenada with anti-aircraft weapons and sophisticated radar systems that would pose a threat to the U.S. That was the justification for going into Grenada. See, it's still a Cuba connection. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, as you told the listeners. When the, when the when the Marines and everybody else landed in Grenada, the whites, do, probably remember the white, but I knew I personally know blacks from Johns Island, South Carolina, who graduated from Grenada because the, as blacks, they couldn't get into med school, especially in the Medical University of South Carolina back in those days. So I personally know people who went to med school in Grenada. And um, when when the, the U.S. soldiers landed in Grenada, the, the students were like, what the hell are y'all doing here? Well, the, you couldn't have this on the media news, right? So what they did was they paid off a few college students, went back and reenacted the whole thing, and then the college students like, oh, thank God the U.S. is here to save us. I'm not making this up. Then those same students that got paid off were flown back to Charleston, South Carolina, at the, Charleston, the U.S. Air Force Base in Charleston, and got paid to kiss the ground when they landed and got off the airplane in Charleston. So for you yeah, folks out there who want a better idea of that, I strongly suggest you see the movie with, um, if you want to see the propaganda aspect of it. Look at the Clint Eastwood movie, Marine Corps movie called Heartbreak Ridge. 
because that's about them going down to Grenada. And I will tell you this, that's a true story in the movie where there's a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps who could not get communications, and he used his credit card and made a long-distance phone call from Grenada to Camp Lejeune and had to contact them there to get air support. <laughs> Some of the stuff you see in Hollywood, do you think it's just total Hollywood? It ain't Hollywood. So I'm just going to finish with that, Mr. Nelson, and tell you that Cuba is under Cuba is going to be under attack again from the propaganda because these folks in the White House, they hate the fact that they were never able to take over Cuba fully the way they wanted. And um, so now you want to ask me about Starbucks? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, sitting while black, right? That's right. That's what it is, profiled. So what do you think about Starbucks? Uh, I, I think it was profiled after two minutes. I mean, you know, most people were in there longer than that, and they hadn't ordered or anything like that, you know. But these two brothers come up, and they sit, and, and in two minutes they call the cops. Well, first of all, let me just tell you, I'm a Barnes & Noble member, and a lot of Barnes & Noble, I have to go back. There was a time, Mr. Nelson, when I used to do radio shows with you, and much of the information that I was able to obtain, it was frustrating because when I tried to recommend books to your listeners, it didn't really help much. Why? Many of the books that I would, I would read, only one bookstore on the planet sold those books. And guess what bookstore that was? Which one's that? Barnes & Noble. And at the time, there was only one distributor in all of the United States. There was an outlet a mail order outlet that way there was always a paper trail out of New York City. So I would order books directly from across the pond from Barnes and Noble and they would send it to New York and New York would ship it to me. But once again there was a paper trail of it doesn't matter because even today as I go to Barnes and Noble, <laughs> most of the books and movies I order, they don't have it, which means I have to leave a paper trail ordering the book. But so a lot of the books on Masonic Order, Knights of Malta, Knights of Templar, those kind of things, I got those from Barnes Noble. Nobody else had it. Of course, today, you know, they got so many chains around the country. And in many of those Barnes and Nobles, you have a Starbucks now. So I'm a member of the Barnes and Noble, and I go to the one here in Fullerton, California, Orange County, which has a Starbucks. And I'll just tell you straight out, I see white folks and Asians sitting their asses in that place all day long reading magazines off the magazine rack. They don't buy the magazine, and they don't buy any coffee or anything in the Starbucks. And I don't see no Fullerton cops coming down there and telling them they have to leave the store. And you can go to any Starbucks for that. But now we got another break, right. so I'll wait until we come back on the other side. <laughs> All right, we got to check the traffic and weather one more time. 800-450-7876, number to call. Speak to Mark. Take your calls next. It's the big show. Rolls on from FM 97.95.9 and AM 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. Thank you for staying with us, folks. Our guest is Mark from Anaheim. As you know, Mark is not his real name. He's really not from Anaheim, but that's another story. 800-450-7876 is the number to call to speak to him. Before I get back to him, let me remind you, coming up uh, later this week, you're going to hear from Egyptologist Tony Browder. Tony's just back from Egypt. He's going to give us an update on his last trip. Minister Wallace is going to be here as well, Nathaniel Jordan, and also clinical psychologist Dr. Jerome Fox. You know his book, Addicted to White. So tell your friends to give it locked on FM 95.9 and AM 4. 1450 WOL. Let's go back to Mark. Mark? Where are the white women at? You just said addicted to white, right? <laughs> hey, yep, addicted to white, yeah. So, when you look at the thing in Barnes and Noble slash Starbucks, what I was saying earlier, I see white folks and Asians down here in Orange County at Starbucks all day long. They don't, and I, it makes me angry because I'm in there buying magazines and I realize. I have to go around a lot of them who are just sitting in there reading magazines all damn day. They don't buy the magazines. They turn it into a library. They don't buy any Starbucks coffee or whatever else. And by the way, because I'm such a frequent buyer of books at Barnes & Noble, I can walk into Starbucks and get free stuff all day long because when I get my receipt from Barnes & Noble, it's telling me, hey, you're entitled to a free this or a free that. I don't go to Starbucks. Let me enlighten you, Mr. Nelson, because I know you have such a bad memory. Um, back in the 90s, as you know, more than a million people were killed in Rwanda. 
And I came on your show and enlightened your listeners on what was really going on in Rwanda. Because, see, I remember very well when the chief of the Hutus and the chiefs of the Tutsis, and folks, don't get it twisted. I'm not mispronouncing it, and I'm not confusing it with what's going on with the Muslims over in Syria. And in and, and Rwanda, you had the Hutus and the Tutsis. And the Hutus and the Tutsis got together and decided no more war. Then the two chiefs get on a plane, the same plane, and their plane is shot out of the sky. When those two tribal leaders died, that's when the war started, as they call it, a civil war. Now, I came on your show and I said I found it very interesting because I noticed that when you look at the photographs of the dead, I didn't see blood protruding from a lot of these bodies. I know I'm not even going to bite waste time asking you if you remember what I suggested. But I found it very interesting because if, if, if the people are dying in a war zone and they're not dying from wounds that is uh, uh, causing blood to be spilled from the bodies, Mr. Nelson, that would suggest chemical warfare. But then I would know that, after all, I was an official nuclear biological chemical warfare inspector instructor for the United States. And I came on your show and I said, you don't see Juan Valdez Columbia coffee commercials anymore. So while these white liberals love to sit in Starbucks and all these others, back in those days, there was a whole lot of them cropping up. Many of them are gone now. But I came on your show back in the 90s and I said, you don't see Juan Valdez Columbia coffee bean commercials anymore. Why? Because most coffee coming in this country today comes from the continent of Africa. And I further stated why these white liberals claim they're down with the hood. They don't ask any questions about the bloodshed that's taking place in countries where that coffee's coming from, that they're sitting there trying to pretend like they're intend, you know, they're the intellects of the United States. But more importantly, Mr. Nelson, I told your listeners, the number one export of, out of Rwanda at the height of that civil war was coffee. The number two export, Mr. Nelson, were the ingredients used in perithium. So you folks, you Google that one, perithium. That's an insecticide. And I wasn't surprised if a lot of the people who were killed in Rwanda were killed from spraying of perithium. By the way, for you folks out there who want to do some research, and I know we have a lot of folks who wore the uniform, Army, Navy, Air, you know, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, whatever. I came on your show and I said, just to show you how stupid the United States was, they actually had a policy, Mr. Nelson, where they were coating our combat uniforms with perithium. That way, when you get deployed to Latin America or African country that has a high population of mosquitoes or flies, instead of having to always put insecticide on, your uniform was treated with perithium. Duh! That means your skin is inhaling that crap 24-7 while you're wearing the uniform. So I, there's no telling today, Mr. Nelson, how many people are screwed up because insecticide is a nerve agent. So I'll never, we'll never know how many people in this, in this country have come back home because they wore those uniforms that were treated with insecticide that they wore 24/7. Seriously. So as far as Starbucks go, in today's realm, I don't support Starbucks. I don't go to Starbucks, and I think it's sad that these two brothers. Because, you know, Mr. Nelson, I, well, you may notice, I'm not going to assume you notice. There are some people suggesting that whole thing was staged. Have you heard that? No, I haven't heard that one. Oh, I've heard it. I've heard black folks going on white talk shows saying they think it was staged. Now, I don't know whether it was staged or not, but this is what I get from it. With my vast experience in law enforcement, with my vast experience of being trained by former Nazis, and I know how they think. You don't win the battle and lose the war. And a lot of folks are touting how these two brothers stood up to the man. And now look at Starbucks. Oh, my God, Starbucks is shaking, quaking in their boots because they're going to shut down 8,000-plus locations to have sensitivity training. Uh, no, I call that good publicity because Starbucks got on top of this very early. And now Starbucks is looking as if they're the good Joes. He admitted he was wrong. He wanted to meet with the two brothers. They'll probably be promised free Starbucks for life if not their own damn franchise instead of a Barnes & Noble. But let's get down to the nitty-gritty on the street level, folks. For many folks listening to this show today, 
We wouldn't even know about it, Mr. Nelson, if it wasn't for a white female who posted that YouTube, right? Correct. And that's why some folks suggest that the whole thing was staged. I don't know if it was staged, but I try to teach you tactics, just like I taught cops and people in uniform and armed forces. I teach you tactics to stay alive and to win the war, not the battle. The manager asked them to leave. They didn't leave. The manager called the cops. What did the cops do, Mr. Nelson? Uh, hand handcuff them and escort no, them. No, they did there. not. Okay, this come on, folks. The cops didn't just walk in and told them turn around and put your hands behind your back. What did the cops do, Mr. Nelson, before they handcuffed them? I guess they had to question them. Told them to leave. Did they leave? No. And that's why they got arrested. So while you folks are sitting here talking about, oh, the two brothers got arrested because they refused. No, they got arrested because they were now seen as, one, refusing to follow the lawful order of uh, law enforcement, and two, disorderly conduct. You can see and hear on the video where they're arguing with the cops when the cops are saying, hey, the management asked you to leave, please leave. They were told to leave, and they didn't leave. Now, don't get it twisted here. Those brothers spent nine hours in jail. Now, I was a sergeant out on the streets. I don't see myself sending six street cops to some Starbucks, which is nothing more than a business dispute. It's even vague whether there's a criminal <laughs> penal code law violated here. I don't care what state you're in. But what I'm telling you, folks, if you don't get anything else out of this and why I'm upset about this whole thing, well, I shouldn't say upset because nothing upsets me except for the fact you all let 45 get elected. I am disappointed that folks are now touting these two black guys as heroes because they sent the message out there when the cops tell you to do something, you can tell them to screw off, and you're going to end up being celebrities for your 15 minutes of fame and may even get some money out of it. Mr. Nelson, that could have gone sideways so quickly, and we could have had another controversial use of force incident where the two brothers either got tased, got beat with nightsticks, or ended up worse, Mr. Nelson, what? <laughs> Dead. Exactly. So while you folks are patting yourselves on the back about these two black guys, they were idiots. When the cops got there, they should have gone outside like the cops told them, waited for their white friend, come back and file a lawsuit if they won against Starbucks, slam them on social media if they wanted to against Starbucks, even if they wanted to make a complaint against the police department, who was nothing more than a tool of private corporate fascists ordering them to leave the store. But when the cops come up and tell you to do something, do it. You make the complaint later. And if you don't, don't be surprised if you end up with your butt beat or dead. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's what happens. Because those cops could have been cops who were overworked, already in a bad mood before they got there. Those brothers could have been somebody under the influence of alcohol or marijuana or some other drug. And things could have gone sideways very quickly. Instead of spending nine hours in jail, they could have been in a morgue. And you guys would be out there complaining and whining and moaning until Al Sharpton shows up like he did in Sacramento. And nobody talks about it anymore. Does that answer your question on what I think about Starbucks, Mr. Nelson? <laughs> that sure does. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with so us. So <laughs> before we take any phone calls, as I always do, I dedicate my appearance. First of all, I thank God. And there are a lot of people praying for me today because they know um, I'm kind of in a cantankerous mood here. So, you you know, your listeners can ask me anything. Just ask one question because I'm only going to ask the one. They can ask me anything they want today, and I'm going to answer it. I'm just telling you because I don't care anymore. But I'm going to dedicate this show today to some white girls, like you said earlier. Where the white women? Zeta to Alvis, College of Charleston. Now, all my life, Mr. Nelson, I've experienced a lot of racism. You know, I grew up down there in Johnson. Well, I got old. I never grew up. But I was down there where my grandmother had her door shut at sunset, and I had to be inside because of the Klan, because of the white citizens' councils, because of the John Burr Society, which just mean-spirited whites down there in Johnson Island, South Carolina. All right? And when I went in the Marine Corps, when I incurred racism... There was an organization, Mr. Nelson, called the National Naval Officers Association. That's a black organization for Marine Corps commission officers as well as Navy commission officers. I never got any help from them. I never got any help from any other blacks in the Marine Corps. 
There was whites who helped me when I was incurring racism. LAPD, I didn't have any help from the Oscar Joel Breyer Association, which I was a member of, just like the NNOA. There was white cops who came to my aid. So you go, folks could talk all the crap you want about black this, black that. I just tell you from personal experience. When I incurred racism, it was white folks who came to my aid. Why? Because I don't kiss nobody's butt and I don't kiss nobody's ring. I'm not a member of some fraternity. I'm not a member of some Masonic organization. And these blacks and these law enforcement agencies, these blacks and armed forces, they're members of fraternities and Masonic orders. And if you're not a member, they don't give a damn about you. That's the reality. Take North Charleston. White boy shoots a black guy in the back. It was the black boy who planted the evidence and then later lied on the police reports. And if it hadn't been for somebody taking a, a, a cell phone cam of that whole shooting, we wouldn't even know what happened in North Charleston with Walter Scott. Now, the white boy goes to jail. And you don't even know the name of the black guy who was the one who's a, a FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, with those Masonic symbols right in their logo. And this Masonic brother of his who was covering for the white boy, just like in the movie Rosewood. We know the white boy beat the woman he was having an affair with. We know they're blaming it on the Negro. And yet, because he's a Mason, we black Masons are going to hide the white boy and allow the entire black community to be burned to the ground and every black man hang from a tree for a crime no black committed. That's who their loyalty is to. All right, hold that thought right. right there. We've got to take a quick break, and then we'll go to the phone calls, but we got to allow our stations to identify themselves down the line, like FM 95.9 and AM 1450, WOL, where information is power. Thank you for staying with us, folks. Or if you're just getting off work at 6 o'clock straight up on the East Coast, our guest is Mark from Anaheim, and the phone number is 800-450-7876 to speak to Mark. Mark, you ready to take some calls? Well, I just want to finish up on this, Mr. Nelson. Did you notice how quick the House Negro from Philadelphia Police Department? Who's the chief of Philadelphia Police Department, Mr. Nelson? I don't know his name, but I saw his, I saw his picture. Is he a colored boy? Oh, yeah. Notice how quickly he came out to let his white masters know that his officers had done nothing wrong? Remember that song back in the day? And don't let it be a black or a white one. They'll slam you down to the street top. Black police showing off for the white cop. <laughs> so while you folks sit here talking about, oh, my God, the white cops are killing blacks, wake up, folks. First of all, most people killed in this country by cops are not black. And secondly, <laughs> I know some black cops out there who <laughs> do things to, to to brothers and sisters that white folks would never even try to get away with. So before we just go into the car, I just want to remind the listeners, I always dedicate this show to some folks. And when I was at the College of Charleston, I didn't have the Omega Psi Phi help me. I didn't have the Kappa Alpha Psi help me. I didn't have the Alpha Kappa Alpha help me. I didn't have the Delta Sigma Thetas help me. Why? Because I wasn't a member of any of their fraternities or sororities. You know who came to my aid, Mr. Nelson? All white female sorority. Zeta Tau Alpha. That's who helped me make it through college. That's who helped me make it when I went to boot camp while I was a freshman in college. And I still have white women from the Zeta Tau Alphas who for more than 30 years have provided me with information that I share with Dick Gregory before he passed over, rest in peace, and what I share with you. I ain't getting no information from colored folks. And that's a fact. So while you you know you sit here and pat yourselves on the back about Harriet Tubman and all these other folks in the Underground Railroad, if it wasn't for white women who waited till their husbands left the plantation, we would have had no underground railroad. That's a fact. Let's take some calls. All right. 800-450-7876. First up, Wes is on line three calling from the ATL. Wes, you don't know, remark from Anaheim. Hey, you know, hey, hey, Mark, man, I don't want to waste my question, but uh, me and you differ on the Bush, how the Bush clan or uh, what they operate. But my main question is you, man. Well, stop, brother. Man. We got a little time. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear what you just said. Oh, about the Bushes, man. They, about the evil, they did all this evil stuff with Kennedy. But my main question, man, not the Bushes, but uh, last time you were there, you said each branch of the military is owned by an individual family, different families. 
Yes, sir. So could you? I was trying to find that man. Could you give me the uh, information on uh, which family owned which branch? Okay, Mr. Nelson. See, this is what Mr. Nelson does. See, in the old days when Brother Greg was alive, I would provide Dick Gregory with the information. It would come from him, and you guys had no idea I was the one providing information. Brother Greg is gone. And what Carl did was put me on the spot one day during a radio show and goes, hey, didn't you talk about five families who own the, all the military? And I remind the listeners, I don't use the term military because that's a condescending term used by folks who actually hate us in uniform. Things have changed. And what my, what my response was to Mr. Nelson in a recent show was, because of all the deregulation under Reagan, you don't even know who owns what anymore. Their name might be on it, but you don't even know. But back in the 90s, the Army was owned by the DuPont family. The Navy was owned by the Rockefeller family. The Marine Corps was owned by the Morgan family. The Air Force was owned by the Mellon family. And the Coast Guard was owned by the Giannini family. And if you don't know who the Giannini family is, that's Bank of America. Because it's not Bank of America, it's Bank of or the Italia America. Giannini was Italian. Okay, I, I wrote it down, man. I wrote it down, bro. I appreciate that's what I need to know. I was trying to find it all over on, on the internet. Brother, I'm sorry to tell you this, but much of what I share with you all, you're not going to find. And I'm going to tell you this, and this is serious, Mr. Nelson. There's a serious sanitizing going on on the internet because information that I used to be able to find, I can't find anymore. You got that right. I post something on uh on, on Barbara Bush. That is, she, is she related to uh, Alice Crowley? That's Alice Crowley's daughter. <laughs> uh. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question because the brother just start off with Bush. Let me just make it perfectly clear here. All Full disclosure. Although the Clinton administration granted me far more access than any other presidential administration during my lifetime. I was always much closer to Daddy Bush. Now, Mr. Nelson alluded to earlier that I was a member of globalist organizations that some of you probably never even heard of. And trust me, they're the ones behind many of these think, tank, think tanks on K Street in D.C. shaping public opinion and world opinion. Um, Daddy Bush and I are <laughs> fellow members of some of the not-so-well-known organizations. And um, I used to keep in touch with Daddy Bush. In fact, when Barbara Pierce Bush recently died, I wrote a thing about her and posted it on Facebook because she, I'm from Charleston. She went to high school at Ashley Hall in Charleston. And um, when one of my LAPD supervisors retired, Bill Clinton was president. He despised Clinton because he believed all the propaganda being told. And if you don't know this, when a police officer retires, you actually get a letter from the White House that's in a big frame. Well, Bill Clinton was the president at the time, and he did not want – my this sergeant that I was working for did not want anything from Bill Clinton. So I asked George – I call him Daddy Bush. I asked Daddy Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush and Barbara Pierce Bush, to please uh, write me a letter directed to this sergeant from LAPD so I could read it during his retirement. So it needless to say, you should have seen the look in people's faces in the room when here I am reading this letter from George and Barbara Bush congratulating him on his 30-year retirement. So I'm just giving you full disclosure here. But I'm not going to lie to you. Daddy Bush was not a conservative. He was a moderate. When he was a skull and bones at Yale, he tried to allow Yale skull and bones to allow black members in. And he was told, shut the hell up and go back in your corner. The bully, which I'm always criticizing. Oh, by the way, folks, get yourself a copy of the current issue of Savoy Magazine. If you want to know who the House Negroes are, they've got more than 100 of them proudly displayed in this Savoy Magazine that's out right now. Anyway, these House Negroes emulate Skull and Bones so much and because they couldn't be members of Skull and Bones, that's why they created the Boule. Now, this was before George Bush was trying to get blacks in, but I'm saying back in the days of W.E.B. Du Bois and all them, because they only care about the so-called talented 10%. The rest of the Negroes, they don't represent you. Never have and never will. 
seriously, I'm just calling a spade a spade. Those, those are the house Negroes. And usually they're mulatto or quadroons or octoroons or whatever. And they're angry at me because they consider me a talent of 10%, but I don't kiss nobody's ring and I don't kiss nobody's butt. My white Masons, they all think I'm some reincarnated Mason, but, you know, that's a show for another day. So, brother, what I'm trying to tell you is, with all this that's going on in the country today, get that magazine, Savoy, and you will see names of people like in charge of stuff like Pfizer, pharmaceutical, and it's a CEO. That's a colored boy that whose name you never even heard of. Because back in the 90s, they were grooming all of it. They were grooming me. I just didn't kiss the ring and sell my soul. So during the Clinton years, when they were grooming all these buppies, black yuppies, and most of them now live in Atlanta, that's the Gabuli headquarters. Now they've secreted themselves in certain positions and offices, especially they love black women. Why? I can hire two white females. Because if I hire a black female, I just kill two quarters with one stone. And she ain't thinking black. She's like a Stacey Dash. She's living in a predominantly white neighborhood behind closed gates that you'll never be able to come to. That's what's going on in this country right now, Mr. Nelson. Wow. Where's and, and by the way, call. and that's who's leading most of the continent on Africa. Because when there's a conscious black person who was supported by somebody like Castro, um, that person got taken out replaced by somebody who the U.S. and the European whites wanted in office. You pay them off, and they screw the the mass majority of the population of the country because a certain elite in that country, they get money paid off, and 80% of the profits go to the British or the U.S. corporations. And it's not just British. I mean, the Dutch were doing this colonization long before the U.S. was even in existence. But that's what's going on. But I know we, we're running on time. i got to shorten these responses so let's move on <laughs> all right uh we gotta take a break right 800-450-7876 i mentioned we gotta take a break we gotta take our last look at the traffic and weather in the dmv folks you want to speak to mark from Anaheim? reach out to us again that number is 800-450-7876 we'll take your calls next on fm 95.9 and am 1450 wol where information is power and thank you for staying with us and our guest, Mark of Manaheim, 800-450-7876. Let's go to line one. Kiki Nelson. from Iowa. Mr. Nelson. Yes, sir. We didn't yes, finish. So I thought, what I'm I trying thought to you tell finished. a brother is, I, you know, you can have your opinions you want about the Bush family, but just let me enlighten you on facts. I told LAPD more than a year before it happened that the four cops, involved with the beating of Rodney King would be found not guilty, and you would see the largest riots in U.S. history. And I told you, Mr. Nelson, and I remind you again, the last time I was on the show, after the riots, and that following November, I went to a <laughs> spook convention where three guys in suits got on the elevator with me and goes, hey, you're working for LAPD now, huh? I go, yeah. What did you think about the riots? I go, anybody with a brain the size of an earthworm could tell there was so much propaganda out there setting up the riots. And these three guys got off the elevator and looked at me and goes, well, you tell Daryl Gates and your boys we ain't done with you yet. You folks don't even realize very little in U.S. politics happens by accident. Even the cops, they're more manipulated than you are. And they don't listen and they don't read anything but certain, so they don't, you know. Oh, by the way, Mr. Ellison, I had a retired LAPD cop, one of my former LAPD recruits, just send me a Facebook message this past weekend saying, when the Civil War starts, I will be in his rifle sights. So what I'm trying to tell you as far as Bush goes, Bush was never a conservative. Bush is a moderate. The Reagan family, there's no love lost between them. Reagan was forced to carry Bush as his running partner if they had any chance of beating Jimmy Carter. And even when that didn't help them, they just went over to <laughs> Iran and sabotage the, the deal that Jimmy was trying to make to free the hostages. And, you know, the Marine hostages were held long enough so Jimmy Carter couldn't get reelected. These same folks are back in the White House, Mr. Nelson. Not the necessarily the president or the vice president, but people behind the scenes telling them what to do, like Ollie North. So what I'm just trying to tell you is, during the 1992, whether you want to call it a civil unrest, a riot, a rebellion, call it what the hell you want it. If it had not been for Daddy Bush, 
there would have been a whole lot of dead black folks and a whole lot of dead brown folks because these John Burr Society members wanted Daddy Bush to send the Marines into L.A. and kill U.S. citizens. That's one of the reasons why he didn't get reelected. Because Bill Clinton, who's his cousin, by the way, would have done it. Those Marines were sitting down here at the long gone Long Beach Naval Base. I was the first LAV platoon commander, light armored vehicle. I helped create the doctrine and tactics for the LAV in the Marine Corps. So I know what an LAV can do. They had all these brand new LAVs from, LAVs from Camp Pendleton staged at the Long Beach Naval Base waiting to go in LA to kill the Negroes and kill the Mexicans. And Bush said no. So whatever you think you might know about Bush, you may not know. So I don't want to belabor this, Mr. Nelson, but I just want to say one last thing on this. I mentioned Savoy. For you folks out there, get yourself a copy of the 17th anniversary Savoy magazine, spring 2001 of 2018. The most influential blacks in corporate America. If you folks want to know who the house Negroes are, you want to know who the boule is, you want to know who the house Negresses are, you need to get yourself a copy of the spring 2018 issue that has Chadwick Boseman on the cover, Hollywood's newest star to the rise. And then you'll know who's selling you out to be part of the globalization. And the last thing on this, Mr. Nelson, guess who they have an article in here about? The first Starbucks in Jamaica. So since we're talking about Starbucks today, there's some you know synchronicity here. They have an article about how happy they are that Starbucks is now in Jamaica. And that's Savoy Magazine, spring 2018. Let's move on, sir. <laughs> well, 800-450-7876. Kiki, you called on you. I hope you're still there from Iowa. Thank you for taking my call. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, I have a question. Last, like a couple of weeks ago, you were on the other morning show. Yes, and ma'am. You, and you had brought up um, how Melania Trump was um, FSB. And um, uh, let's correct that. What I suggested to the listeners is this: Trump. If, if anybody get anything out of the interview with Stormy Daniels and the other hoochie mama, Trump and his wife don't even sleep in the same bed. When folks And I tell you, I keep it simple. Anybody who tells you there's no such thing as white privilege, you know damn well Barack Hussein Obama would have never been president if Michelle Obama had naked photographs on the Internet, especially freaky naked photographs of other women. But nobody talks about it because she's white. Nobody talks about the fact Melania Trump came to this country on an illegal visa passport and was working here while Trump wants to send immigrants out of this country because she's white. And more importantly, I stated, well, it's no big deal that they sleep in separate beds because I've never believed they're really a marriage of arrangement anyway. It's kind of like the movie Total Recall where Arnold Schwarzenegger thought he was married to his wife, Sharon Stone, when the whole time she's married to some other guy in CIA. I truly believe that perhaps some of the rumors and allegations regarding the fact that Melania Trump may be an FSB asset, there may be some truth to it. But I'm sorry, sister, go ahead. <laughs> well, um what I was I was saying was, do you think? Because I remember you were also talking about the the Parkland shooter. Do you yes, think ma'am. that now of uh, what's going on with all the shootings um, and uh, this talk about war with Russia and everything else? Um, do you think that the soldiers that are placed here, maybe, or the spies that are placed here, um, can that are already in the United States can infiltrate our government system, and it could be like a, like that movie Salt. Remember, if it wasn't for Angelina Jolie stopping all of it, um, basically, we we you know the Russians would have made us go to war and everything. So, do you see something like that happening or no? And I'll take my comments off air. Thank you. Yes. Now, folks, the only reason I stopped the sister because I have to clarify because when see when the sister comes on and says that I said Melania Trump was FSB. That's taking my words out of context. I don't need no drama from the White House, so you know Dan Wells listening to the show. Anyway, Salt is a movie I highly recommend. Angela, Angelina Jolie, and I also recommend a movie with Sidney Poitier from the 80s called Little Nikita, if you want an idea. But you can go back and more recently, watch the TV series Homeland, season five, which clearly shows you somebody who's a station chief in Germany who was compromised while she was a station chief in Lebanon 
Actually, I'm sorry. She was a station chief in Iraq. And the Russians compromised her. And she had been working as a mole for the She was a double agent for the Russians ever since. We have... <laughs> we. Uh, the U.S. has assets in government agencies in other countries. But, you know, sometimes the U.S. really thinks that, oh, my God, we're so great. You know damn well we got Russian assets and high positions of power in this country. Seriously. Many of them, like suggested in the movie Little Nikita, they're never playing an active role until one day somebody knocks on their door and calls on them to, to fulfill an assignment. And as far as what the sister was saying earlier in regards to the Parkland shooting, very little in politics happens by accident. And all I'm telling you is this, folks. I just keep it simple. You I don't believe anything I tell you. You draw your own conclusions. You do your own research. The vast majority of mass shootings at schools in this country happen at white, middle class, or upper middle class, predominantly white schools and predominantly white neighborhoods. One, that's why they don't have any metal detectors. But two, those kind of things don't happen here. And three, white folks with money, after a shooting like that, what do you think they do with their children? They take them out those upper middle class white public schools and put them in charter schools or private schools. I'm just calling a spade a spade, folks, because Betsy DeVos, who's Secretary of Education, hates public schools. The John Burr Society hates public schools. They don't call them public schools. They go like the movie Ride, of the, Ride with the Devil that shows you Quantrill and the supporters of the Confederate States of the Arm America burning down the first thing in the town. The government school. That's what they call public schools. They hate the U.S. government. I'm not being hyperbolic when I tell you this. They want to privatize everything. Donald Trump is not guarded by Secret Service. He's guided by his private guards because they don't have to report to a government agency oversight committee when he's committing something that's unethical, immoral, or illegal. And they're going to privatize everything. So for all you idiot cops out there who voted for Trump, Check your tax plan this year, because a lot of things you could claim on taxes before Trump got in office and signed that Republican bill, you're not going to be able to claim on taxes coming up next year. And I laugh, Mr. Nuss, when I hear folks going, oh, because of Trump, I've already saved 25. How do they know what they save? That tax law doesn't go into effect until you find your taxes for next year. And this is how stupid Americans are. So for all you folks in law enforcement, all you folks in uniform and armed forces, Look how many benefits you're going to lose now under the tax plan because they hate federal agencies. They're replacing all of you with private. And so all you folks who keep protesting the public police, they've already got their private cops. Worse, they've already got RoboCop. So I hope that answers the sister's question. All right. 800-450-7876. Uh, we're coming up. We're going, to take a, we're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we'll speak to Al. Al's calling us from Tennessee. Folks, you too can join the discussion with Mark from Anaheim. Reach out to us. Our number is toll-free. It's worldwide. It's 800-450-7876. We'll take all of your calls next as the big show rolls on from FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. Are you thinking of starting a business? Ready to turn your passion into profit? Are you unsure of where to start? Well, I'm here to help you. I am Danielle Nicole, and I am all in your business. I'm here to discuss the steps and give you the tools and resources to start, build, and grow a business and life you'll love. Listen to me live every week, Saturdays at 4 p.m. to 4.30 on WOL 1450 AM and 95.9 FM News Talk Radio. Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you, A, put yourself in her shoes? How could he do this to you? And for Sheila, she, she has split ends. B, console her. Oh, sweetie, this is going to happen a lot. Four, maybe five more times before you get married. C, take charge. Got to get this all straightened out. Keep a little talking to, man to man, mano a mano. Hey, Steve. Is now a good time? No? 
Okay, no problem. Bye. Or D, help her find a new boyfriend. I know a great place to meet boys. The internet. Nice, single, boys. Never mind. How about some ice cream? As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. I get it. Your desk has been there for you. Holding up your computer, your unused stapler, and that plant you forgot to water. But maybe it's time to leave your desk and spend your lunch break volunteering with Meals on Wheels. Doing Meals on Wheels for me is the joy that I look for at the end of my week. I'll come to the door with one meal and I'll walk away with a full heart. Drop off a warm meal and get more than you expect. Volunteer at americaletsdolunch.org. That's americaletsdolunch.org. Brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. The Carl Nelson, Nelson Show, Show is here daily from 4 to 7 p.m. on WOL. News Talk 1450 AM and 95.9 FM. And thank you for zero seventy eight seven six. Before we left, we are about to get to speak with Al. Al's calling us from Tennessee. He's on line four. So, Al, we're going with Mark from Anaheim. Thank you, Mr. Nelson, for taking my call. Uh, Mark, what's going on in Antioch, man? I want to get your uh, opinion what's going on down here. Is this a race war continuance, or is this a distraction from the uh, Trump lawsuit? Um. The Civil War has been going on for a while, but it's not confined to race. Um, even like during the last Civil War, it's from the 1800s. You take a guy out here in California, we have Vandenberg Air Force Base, but there was a General Cook who served in the Union Army. His daughter was married to Jeb Stewart, who was a general in the Confederate Army. His son was a general in the Confederate Army. So when it comes to Civil War, it's not a race thing. It's dividing up. Like I said, when I have a LAPD cop who was one of my former recruits, not only that, I was personally invited as the guest to his wedding. I was the highest ranking person in a U.S. Armed Forces uniform at his wedding. I was the spoke person who spoke at his wedding, and now he's telling me that when the Civil War starts, I will be in his rifle sights. This ain't about black and white, brother. Don't get it twisted. Antioch, unfortunately, you have a lot of idiots out there. Some of them are borderline schizophrenic, bipolar, whatever you want to call it. Also crazy, listening to people like Alex Jones and all these other far right wing radio stations, listening to Trump saying that Obama was a birth, you know, he wasn't born in this country. And they're carrying out the stuff that they hear on the radio. So here you got a guy, he's a racist, he's a member of a white sovereign citizens group, but he was also a person who suffered major mental illness. But since we have to reduce the population in this country, and since the National Rifle Association has given so much money to elected officials, and since the gun manufacturers, especially when there's a Republican office, their gun sales go down, we have to find a way that even somebody with a mental illness can still get their guns back. So what you do instead of destroying those guns when you take them away, you give it to somebody else who's in the family. And then that father gives it to their son who goes out and kills a bunch of Negroes. They're playing down the whole idea that everybody targeted at that shooting was black. And this guy was known for being a hardcore, right-wing, make America great again, Alex Jones follower, white, sovereign citizen. John Birch Society. Um, He's not John Birch. He's one of those on the fringe. John Birch is more sophisticated. I live out here in Orange County where, you know, we have wealthy white folks or like down in La Jolla where we have wealthy white folks, like even Mitt Romney has a house in La Jolla. So down here, we don't call it the John Birch Society. We call it the Welch Foundation. It's kind of like the Nazis. It's kind of like the Nazis and the skinheads. Skinheads are the idiot fringe on the lower levels that do the dirty work for the Nazis behind the scenes that you normally don't see. The John Burr Society is behind the scenes who you normally don't see, and they've got folks like this guy and what Hillary Clinton alluded to as the deplorables out there doing their dirty work because they don't even know they're being manipulated. A great movie that shows you that is a movie called American History X. Yes. Remember, Stacey That's Keach not- was behind the scenes, and he never got seen. Right, right. Got so I hope that helps to answer your question, brother. Hey, I appreciate All right. it. Thanks, thanks, Al. 
Mr. Nelson, before we take another call, let me just make this short because I know we're running out of time here. For those folks out there who want to reach out to me, and I'm going to tell you, uh, Mr. Nelson, we got some problems in this country, not this country, around the world. Because I did a radio show with you earlier this month, and when less than an hour after being on your show, I had more than 100 people find me on Facebook. So I'm just going to give this out. If you want to reach out to me or you want to see some of the stuff that I share, because I share stuff that you're not hearing in the U.S. media. Like, for example, I just said a journalist in Nicaragua was killed by the government while doing Facebook Live. Journalists are being killed around the country. So if you, if you want to get out, reach out to me, just find me at Mark from Anaheim, Political Sarcasm 101. And that's on Facebook. Not the group site, the fan page. Mark from Anaheim. Political Sarcasm 101. Let's move on, Mr. Nelson. 800-450-7876. Thanks, Al. Let's go to Mill. Mill's in northeast D.C. Northwest D.C., I'm sorry, on line five. Mill, you're on Mark from Anaheim. Is Mill there? All right, Mill left us. Those corrupt Baltimore cops got him. (laughs) Cleve is calling from L.A. Cleve, you're on with Mark from Anaheim. Yes. Yeah, thanks and respect, Carl. Mark, I'd like to know your thoughts on the so-called Militia Act and how it relates to this president. Give thanks and respect, Carl. Mark? Well, before you go, brother, what do you mean by Militia Act? Uh, you recall the Militia Act? I think it was the early Eisenhower administration. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the Militia Act, sir. Okay. I'll call back later when I have more info. All right. Well, what I will say, Mr. Nelson, because I'm not sure what the brother from L.A. was referring to, I will say that I know in this country we have what a lot of people try to espouse to as the Posse Comitatus Act. Now, in regards to militia, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the militia. The Second Amendment, unlike what white America is being taught and a lot of confused Negroes by the NRA, it doesn't have a darn thing to do with a tyrannical overstretching federal government or occupying government. I grew up on Johnstown, South Carolina, sort of, because I never really grew up, got older. The Stono River runs through Johnstown. I played in the Stono River. One of the biggest slave uprisings was the Stono Rebellion. So for you folks out there, do some research, because I'm sure you never heard of it. Stono Rebellion. Much of what the Second Amendment is all about is related to two things, Mr. Nelson. Blackbeard, the most infamous pirate in U.S. history. Do you know that 20% of his pirates were black? No, I did not know that. And many of them were runaway slaves. Blackbeard Mm -hmm. occupied Charleston. Imagine how white folks felt, especially slave owners, in Charleston being occupied by not only Blackbeard, but blacks. Some of them runaway slaves. Then a few years later, you have the Stono Rebellion. And the blacks who were caught after that rebellion, they were decapitated and their heads were put on posts all around Charleston to remind all the other Negroes, no more slave rebellion. When the Congress was deciding what laws to maintain on the books and what laws to get rid of, when the Second Amendment came up, it was slave owners from places like Virginia, and South Carolina, who reminded them of Harper's Ferry and the Stono Rebellion and all these other, you know, violent acts. And that's why Congress agreed to the Second Amendment, because the militia were all these young white males who were actually required to have a gun at home to be called up in the event of a major slave uprising. That's what the Second Amendment is about. Doesn't have a damn thing to do with no occupying government. And so folks folks who are out there confused, the National Guard is not your militia. For you folks listening from California, I suggest you do some research because California has a state militia. South Carolina, the Citadel, the boys that fired on Fort Sumter that started the Civil War. That's a South Carolina militia school. BMI, Virginia Military Institute, that's a state militia school. 
you have militias all over this country. So I'm not sure what the brother was alluding to because they were around a lot longer than <laughs> when when he's suggesting it was put into play in the 40s. But I hope that helped the listeners out there get a better idea of who the militia really is. All right. I got a tweet question for you. Uh, caller wants to know, please ask your guest about the prior race forward campaign efforts of Starbucks right after Michael Brown's murder. I'm not familiar with that specifically, so I can't really address that. Yeah, I, I think they, they try to tackle the race thing, and they try to have a dialogue going, and, and they got slammed for it. You know, they used to have because the, they're phonies, on the cups. and they're still phonies, and people are falling for it now, and that's why some of the conscious blacks out there are suggesting that this whole thing may have been staged. This is a, nothing but a PR. This is a major – you know how much free publicity Starbucks is getting because of this? And how good they look because they're going to shut down 8,000 stores. The white manager at the Philadelphia store is no longer there. And I, you know, I'm not going to say this thing was staged. But you know what? Then there might be something there. <laughs> there might be something there. When you think you're fighting the system, many times you're doing exactly what the system wants you to do. Mm. I, I know you've uh, you've touched about on the journalist murders, uh, but where in Mexico I have heard in, in Nicaragua. Where else? Oh, have please, Mister uh, Nelson. Last attack? year alone, more than two hundred. God, there were like two hundred journalists murdered in Mexico, and there's so much the day that I wanted to cover that we never got to because you told me that I was going to tell the listeners about the rise of fascism in Europe. Now, back when you and I did radio shows in the nineties, Mister Nelson, as the Cold War was ending, we had Czechoslovakia. Today it's called the Czech Republic, and the other side is called Slovakia. You do realize they had a major Hitler birthday celebration last weekend, right? Yeah, I saw some other stuff on that. And what day did they celebrate Hitler's birthday on, Mr. Nelson? Uh, I can't recall. It was over the weekend, though. Come on, Mr. Nelson. When is everybody lighting up, blazing? Oh, 420. Oh, so let me refresh your memory, Mr. <laughs> Nelson. Depending on who you talk to, Hitler's birthday is 420 or 419. So for you folks out there, you know, do some research. When did Columbine shooting happen? When did Waco happen? When did Oklahoma City bombing happen? But I know since we're not woke, we don't even see the connection. Okay. So when the brother was asking about militias, wasn't there militia groups involved with the Oklahoma City bombing? Because you have these white sovereign citizens who have created their own militia. But I know we got a break coming up. All right, right, we'll, I'll let you finish your thought on the other side. 800-450-7876. Speak to Mark in Mannheim. We'll take your calls next right here on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. Thank you for rolling with us and our guest, uh, Mark in Mannheim. Number to call to speak to him, 800-450-7876. We'll get back to you in a moment. Let me just tell you some of the folks who are going to be stopping by in the next few days. Dr. Jerome Fox is going to join us. You know his best-selling book, Addicted to White. Also, uh, he's a clinical psychologist, by the way. Also, the Minister of Wellness, Nathaniel Jordan, will be here. Also, Tony Browder, back from Egypt. You know, he's an Egyptologist. He's uh, back from his excavation tour, and he's going to give us an update on what it was like over there in Kemet. Uh, so let's go back to Mark. Mark, I'm going to let you finish your thought. Then Christopher in Richmond, Virginia, wants to talk to you. Well, one of the things I wanted to say, because, you know, we were, like, getting into the break earlier and talk about Cuba. I've already recommended on this radio show in the past, and I highly recommend it for those who haven't seen it. you got to see the movie American Made. If you folks want an idea why Harvey Weinstein was taken down, because he made that movie American Made. And even though I praised that movie, one of the things that disappointed me about that movie, the movie shows you him being recruited in the CIA from TWA in the 70s. That's a bunch of crap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Doug, you know how far back? Oh, God. We call him the, the greatest treetop fly of all time. But Barry Seal, Barry Seal was running guns into Cuba when we supported Bautista. And then later on when we switched sides, people found out, guess what? Barry Seal was transporting guns into Cuba when we supported Castro. So he didn't get recruited in the 70s like that movie suggests. In fact, you know, Mr. Nelson, you know who was one, one of his running partners were well when he was a teenager? No, who's that? Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> Let's take some more calls. <laughs> Connecting those dots. As I mentioned, Christopher's waiting for us from Richmond. Christopher, you're on with Mark from Anaheim. Yes, sir. How you doing, Mr. Nelson? How you doing, Brother Mark? Happy to be here, sir. Still obnoxious as always, I am. 
<laughs> it's up to you. I asked you a bunch of questions the other day on Facebook, and you answered all of them. But I think I got a a question about uh, Brother Terry Albury, the FBI agent that's looking at like five years for leaking information to the press. Well, he tend to be a whistleblower and. and- Nice, yeah, yeah. nice mulatto boy who thought he was doing the right thing, and he's getting more time in prison than than spies who we catch here from other countries. But what's your question, brother? <laughs> Why is this such a double standard? Because I see Comey, he just released a book about his, you know, his, his interaction. Uh, I'm sorry. I am holding that book in my hand as we talk. It's called A Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leadership, James Comey. Because Barnes & Noble knew I wanted that book, so they said, hey, brother, you want me to put your name on the list so you can be one of the first ones to get James Comey's book? I'm seriously, I, I am literally holding that book in my hand as you talk. But go ahead, brother. <laughs> yes, yes. I want to know why. How come his Mr. Albury got charges and Comey is just he he, he making a bag off of it? He getting he cashing in right now. <laughs> and just for the once again, just for the listeners out there, what's the brother's name that most folks don't know about that's getting railroaded? Terry Albury. There it is. I posted about Terry Albury. I've been following his case. I feel for the brother, but he's another one of those uh, up-and-coming boule boys who thought he was part of the system and didn't realize how he was being manipulated. And worse, when he found out what was really going on, he took it the wrong way. Um, I have no sympathy for him because he didn't know the rules of the game, and he played the game, and he lost. James Comey, on the other hand, I came on this show, and I've said it many times on my Facebook site, James Comey and I have one thing in common. We're old school. When LAPD was going after me because I refused, they knew I wasn't going to go along with a controversial, which is now an infamous (laughs) officer-involved shooting that I was the original incident commander for. They're always trying to do damage control. In law enforcement, most cops are not racist, like you're being told. They're human beings. Cops are a reflection of society. The problem is, when a cop makes a mistake, the law enforcement agency, instead of just saying, guess what, you know what, we screwed up, we apologize, and we're going to work on this so it never happens again, the way Starbucks pretends they're doing right now. No, instead, law enforcement does damage control, and they go out of their way to protect that officer because they don't want to look bad, and the cover-up is worse than the actual unfortunate incident. So I say that to you because when it comes to James Comey, one thing he and I have in common, when LAPD was going after me, that's to show you how audacious they were going after me. I got called into an office one day, and I was... presented with a supervisor's log that I had done. And they're like, something's wrong here. You just seem to be cutting and pasting your logs. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they showed me two different logs on two different days that were identical. And I'm like, okay, something's wrong here. So I go to the LAPD computer. I go inside the computer. I pull up the log that supposedly I had submitted on that particular day. And sure enough, it's an identical log to a log that had been done like two months earlier. So there's a little panic. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? However, see, LAPD doesn't realize I've got friends around the world. I've got people who have storage places in places that's not even in this state or this country that have documents that if anything ever happens to me, they're going to release those documents to make sure they know that my, my reputation will never be tarnished. I kept a memory drive stick. So I plug my memory drive stick into that LAPD computer, and I pulled up the log that I did submit, printed out a copy, and I took it into the captain's office. Now, they could have said I retyped this for one thing. I turned that log in in less than two minutes. So there was no way I could have typed that log up. And later on, I found out they said, whoa, he just dodged another bullet. Why am I telling you this? James Comey is the same thing. We're old school. We keep a paper trail where nobody else knows where it is. James Comey knows how dirty the Trump administration is. Trump is mafia. Trump is a misogynist. Trump is a bigot. And Trump is a liar. Now, who investigates the mob? FBI. Who investigates bank fraud? FBI. Who is Trump trying to take down? FBI. I posted this more a year ago, and I run a Quantico Facebook site where the FBI Academy is located, where I played as a teenager, and I know FBI agents, and James Comey knows where the bones are buried. 
All right. Thanks, Christopher. 800-450-7876. Paul's reaching out to us from across the pond. He's in London. He's on line Oh, six. my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm a from Anaheim. <laughs> Thank you for taking my call. You're and alive. You not. You're alive. I'm just about, just about, just about. Brother, but, um, you, brother just... please, before you, brother, before you go on, I know we're running out of time, but this is so important. Please tell the folks here across this side of the pond that the same crap that's going on here is going on over in UK because the Mercer family, who's funding Trump to put him in office, are the same people that's funding Brexit over there. Brother, you, you, you are, all I can say is that you are an absolutely very informed person. You're a very informed person. Um, um, you know, you, you're, you're on, on the terms of the Mercer family, that name rings a bell. And I've done a small amount of research on that. And you've just reminded me of something which I knew before you, and you just reiterated it in my mind. You are an informed person. But can I say this, my brother? Um, yes. You know, some of the thoughts while you were talking occurred to me. We, we get a very, um, uh, um, what had the word to describe, a, a media-driven description of America is. Now, if you ask me, looking at an, as an outsider, America seems almost like a p- police state where police are free to kill people and execute people on the street without no comeback. Um, now, some of the things I hear you say would not be said in, in, in this country on the op- on, on the open radio. just wouldn't be said. And if they were said, the person would be disregarded as a lunatic. But I know a lot of what you say is true, absolutely true. Um, so my question, my real question for you, and it's a bit off what I've just mentioned, but I ask you to address this in your mind. You haven't got the time to fully address what I'm going to say to you now. This signal from this radio station is being blocked in the, in the U.K., um, you hear that, Mr. Nelson? This signal from your radio station is being blocked in the UK. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm familiar. I've got a lot of people out over there have told us that. Not just in the UK, on, on European continent as well. But go ahead, yeah. Paul. Yeah. Now, um, I haven't got to the bottom of it. I've done my research. Uh, the, uh, the internet service provider tells me it's not them. They reckon it's not the government, because if it was the government, then um, they would have a note of that. So I don't know where this is coming from. But at the end of the day, the real question I want to ask, and you may not have time to, to deal with this, is is the, the, is the poisoning of a Russian agent fact or fiction? <laughs> okay, brother. <laughs> hey, you know I love you, right? Brother, you keep up the good work. Stay strong and stay safe. <laughs> Mr. Nelson, there's so much going on. This is what I'm talking about. Today, the mm-hmm. only reason I agreed to do this show with you today since you called me at the last minute, you know, CPT, but it's all good. I have folks from around the world, Mr. Nelson, who said, please come back on your show if you ask me to come on today. And it's because of brothers like Paul and, and, and over across the U.K. because disinformation, misinformation, and control of information is going on. And it's not just here, it's worldwide. For example, Mr. Nelson, right now in Hungary, there was a guy in Hungary who got the laws changed so that even though he wasn't going to be president, because, you know, he termed out as there's only so many years you can be president, but he had the law changed where he was going to now become prime minister and still be in charge of the country. And folks didn't go for it. Um, there's so much stuff that's going on, and, and, and with Hitler's birthday, with things going on in Armenia. Armenia is the main country where a guy tried to take over and still be in charge of the country, even though he wasn't president anymore. Mr. Nelson, today is Armenian Justice Day. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I saw some reports about that. Yeah, you saw yeah, some reports. Nobody's going to talk about it here because they don't want to call it a genocide. Years from now, what's going on in Lebanon, what's going on in the guys that strip in West Bank, they'll be calling that genocide. But see, that's not politically correct. So I'm just saying, when Paul comes on from the UK, he knows that I provide information because I have sources all around the world. And it's sad because much of what I share, your listeners are never going to read in the U.S. newspaper. The Mercer family is the financial backers of Trump. And what they're doing to destroy this country is the same thing they're doing in the U.K., Meanwhile, you have other major wealthy billionaires that's fomenting hatred and anger in places like Hungary, 
the Czech Republic, the Slovak Republic. I'm talking around the Mr. Another fact it's kind of ironic. The the one of the last countries left standing is Germany. And Merkel, she's gonna go down too. They're gonna take her down. This is not a US thing. This is a oligarch around the world creating their so called new world order in the fashion they want. There's a major war going on in the intelligence community and there's a major war going on in the Catholic Church. And when the brother Paul calls and comes in and talks about this, and when you hear that this radio show is being blocked, thank God there's certain listeners to your show, Mr. Nelson, who make a YouTube of this show, because if it wasn't for that, nobody else would even know I was on the show today. So I thank Paul for having the courage to call in, because over in the U.K., everything is monitored. And I just pray for his safety, but let's move on, because I know we're running out of time. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, I'm going to let you tell folks how they can reach you. All right. So, once again, you can reach me at Mark from Anaheim, Political Sarcasm 101, and that's Facebook, the fan page, not the group site. Now, I dedicated this show today to the Zeta Tualis of the College of Charleston from the years 75 through 81. However, there is somebody else I wanted to dedicate the show to today. I'm dedicating my appearance today to Carl Nelson, who is a journalist, <laughs> unlike most of these other talk show hosts. And, Mr. Nelson, thank you for putting my life in danger again. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you, Mark. He's out. Folks, we're out, too. Stay strong. Stay positive. We'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock right here on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. W-O-L, where information is power.